Welcome to the first webinar for Covidence UK in 2023. My name is Adrian Martineau and today I'm joined by Julia Vivaldi, the study statistician. And today Julia is going to present to you data relating to symptoms that have been reported from the Covidence UK questionnaires that may be associated with long COVID. Julia, over to you. Thanks, Adrian. So long COVID is still a very poorly understood condition. It's defined by NICE and other bodies such as the CDC as symptoms lasting more than four weeks after a SARS-CoV-2 infection that can't be explained by anything else. The diagnosis relies on self-report of symptoms, so there's no diagnostic test available to confirm whether or not people have long COVID. And because it remains vaguely defined and not well understood, it's possible that some people with ongoing symptoms wouldn't declare themselves as having long COVID, maybe because the symptoms are minor, maybe because they didn't know they ever had the virus or they just might not have made the connection. So the question is, how can we capture all of these long lasting symptoms without relying on someone's self diagnosis? And is there a way of checking that these symptoms are indeed linked to having had COVID-19 or perhaps another acute respiratory infection? And we do this by considering the presence or absence of symptoms as reported by everyone in the cohort, regardless of whether or not they say they have long COVID. So you can see here, there is a series of questions on potential long COVID symptoms. We ask these regularly to anybody who says they have long COVID, but at times we have asked them to all participants, regardless of their long COVID status. For this analysis, we're going to take one of these snapshots of the cohort and look at the symptoms across everyone and see whether it's possible to extract different groupings of symptoms. For example, we might expect to see a group of people reporting symptoms such as fatigue and difficulty concentrating, but few symptoms related to pain or gastrointestinal problems. Or we might expect to find a group of people who present with aches and pains, but not with respiratory problems such as breathlessness or coughing. We can then explore whether any of the identified groupings are associated with having had COVID-19 or another respiratory infection. So we're still in the very early stages of this analysis, but here is a preview of the sort of results we're currently seeing. So using data from more than 14,000 Covidence UK participants, we have fit models with different numbers of classes. And as you can see here, the first model groups our participants into two groups according to their symptoms one containing 83% of our participants and the other containing 17%. When considering how many of our participants had COVID-19 before the survey went out, you can see that the percentages differ substantially. So 11% in class one and 27% in class two. We see something similar when we split our participants into three groups. So we drop down to 69% in our first class with a middle group containing 25% of participants and a third group containing just 7%. Again, the percentage of people who had COVID-19 seems to differ substantially and increases across the groups. And with a four class model, once again, we see something similar in terms of the distribution of participants who had COVID-19. It's worth noting that the majority of the people reporting COVID-19 reported having the infection more than four weeks before the survey. So those are, those are the percentages that are in square brackets on the table. So this would mean that any ongoing symptoms would fit within the definition of long COVID if they had no other cause. Now the question is, how do these groups differ according to symptoms? Here we can see the plots of reporting the various symptoms or conditions which are listed along the bottom of the graph. The difference between the groups is captured by the distance between the lines, as well as the different shapes of the lines. The higher points on this graph show a higher probability of reporting those symptoms. So unsurprisingly, in the two class division, the majority of participants don't report many problems other than a few problems with sleep, mild breathlessness and muscle or joint pain. The second class is generally showing high levels of all problems, but it looks as though there is a more substantial difference in the symptom profile for memory problems and dizziness. With the three class model, the picture is a little messier. Once again, the classes show general increases in all reported problems, but there are a few symptoms to which the lines differ more substantially. So for example, participants in class three are the only ones who are really reporting moderate or severe breathlessness. And while class two participants are similarly likely to report problems with sleep, 
class three is the only class showing high probability of reporting fatigue and memory problems. Finally, we look at the four class model. The classes again seem to represent a change in the frequency of reporting all symptoms, but we're seeing the biggest differences around symptoms such as depression, fatigue, memory problems and breathlessness. It is worth noting that in this case, the fourth class is very small, just 3% of participants, so this might not be a meaningful result. So in conclusion, it seems as though there may be a link between the prevalence and severity of various symptoms and having had COVID-19. This seems to be true even when the majority of people who reported COVID-19 had it more than four weeks before. The different groups we observed were mostly defined by an increased probability of reporting all the symptoms we explored, but we noticed some more substantial differences for symptoms such as fatigue, memory problems, and moderate to severe breathlessness and depression. As this analysis uses data from January 2021, our findings only hold for non-vaccinated people who were infected with the original viral strain. So the next steps in this analysis would be to test the association statistically, making sure to adjust for other factors that could influence the prevalence of the symptoms we explored, such as age and sex. We also need to see whether the time since infection affects how people are grouped or their likelihood of being in one group rather than another. And we finally want to see whether we can find similar associations with other acute respiratory infections. Great. Well, thank you very much, Julia, for that very clear presentation. And I'm sure everyone like me is looking forward to hearing an update on the analysis uh, as you move ahead with it. For the time being, I just want to sign off. Thank all of you who've taken the time to watch this. Thank you again for continuing to complete our questionnaires and look forward to seeing you next month. Goodbye.